Hey guys, hello. Hey, hello again. Hey MKZ, hey Marino. Thanks for being here. Uh, let's, uh, look, I was just going to do some study, so I thought I'd put the camera on, do some live stream, hang out with you guys if you're around. Um, it's lovely to see you guys here. And uh, yeah, feel free to ask any questions or um, just banter along or just keep me in the background while you guys are doing your own study, whatever works for you guys. But uh, yeah, let's do, a, I'm going to try and just maybe half an hour or an hour of uh, ECGs, just working my way through the ECG for Emergency Physician textbook. Um, and who knows, maybe one day one medical student will learn something and it'll all be worth it. I mean, I'm going to do this anyway for my training and I just feel like getting better at ECGs. So I thought it was a good uh, use of my time. Might turn my fan on in the background. Sorry if there's going to be a bit of background noise. I'll try and keep it lower. Oh yeah, there is a little bit of background noise. I'll keep the mic nice and close to my mouth. Let's keep hustling, guys. All right, let's go. All right, the STEM is a 32-year-old, oh, sorry, no, it's ECG number 32. We've got a 60-year-old female with acute onset of expressive dysphagia. Oh, aphasia. Oh, my pen's not working. I need my Apple Pencil to work. Okay. There you go. Uh, excessive aphasia. I mean, you always worry about a droopy face and a stroke. Um, that's the kind of life-threatening stuff. Uh, it could also be lower muscle, uh, lower motor neuron issues, but uh, career, lower motor neuron issue. But anyway, we have an ECG. Um, so obviously, if there was AF, you worry about stroke. Here, it does not look like AF. This looks a bit abnormal. We've got. Um, Let's get a rate. So these are PVCs, premature ventricular contractions, and um, they look like they're following most of the QRSs. They're abnormal. Uh, let's just check a couple of things. First of all, is it regular? Obviously not. Cool. But we've got P waves before the QRSs, except for the PVCs. So I don't know if that technically is a sinus rhythm, because there are P waves before QRSs, but not for the PVCs. So I don't know if that actually qualifies for technically being sinus rhythm. Um, I think you just call it by Gemini when you have these PVCs, premature ventricular complexes, following the QRSs. So th this is... By Gemini, and I, you know, that can be. I'm pretty sure that can be related to like a stroke. As a transient phenomenon of a stroke, but I have no idea how that would, like, how does something in the brain manifest in the heart? No idea. Hey Sylvia, welcome. Thanks for saying hi. Uh, So, probably having a stroke because of the bigeminy and the expressive aphasia. These QRSs are a little wide. It's more than three box. And it kind of looks like um, a right bundle branch pattern. Oh, but the thing is, it's only on the PVCs which are always wide. Sorry, because it's not wide on the non-PVC complexes. So, it's not a real... So I think that means that it's not a real bundle branch block. Um, so like you see this massive ST depression. It's not present on the normal QRS complexes. So it's not real ST depression. I think that's how Bigeminy works. Anyway, let's have a look at the answers. Yeah, sinus rhythm. PVCs. Bigeminy. So you do call it sinus rhythm. Yes, it's SR even with PVCs present. 
And that kind of makes sense. It means that the actual rate is getting triggered by the sinus node, but there's uh, these ectopic ventricular contractions also pumping blood um, episodically. So strokes, either ischemic or hemorrhagic, are often associated with changes on the ECG. You can often get tachydysrhythmias, AV blocks, ST segment changes. So the AV blocks is interesting. Uh, let me bring my desk up. Oh, I'm going to break my neck again. Do you guys have to study for anything? It's a bit better on my... That should be a bit better on my neck. <laughs> yeah, so you can get all these tachydysrhythmia stuff with uh, PPCs, uh, anti-wave abnormalities, and the findings are usually transient, as was the case with this patient. Cool. Good job. Next ECG. Hmm. Small QRS voltages, you know. This is not very high voltage, which could mean, um, like, it means that there's tissue between the pr electric probes and the actual heart conducting electricity. So usually it's like COPD, so hyperinflated lungs, or it's body habitus, so subcutaneous tissue or fat. Body habitus. 54-year-old man, 24 hours after receiving thrombolytic therapy for an AMI, currently asymptomatic. Okay, so he's had a heart attack, and um, we're just looking at the ECG of him asymptomatic 24 hours later. Sounds important. What's the rate? About four and a bit squares, so 300 divided by four. And a little bit, so just under 75. Let's just call it 70. P waves preceding every QRS, yes, so it's sinus rhythm. Rate rhythm, axis, positive, positive, so normal axis. The key thing here after someone's had a myocardial infarction is serial ECG, so it's comparing this to previous ECGs. Um, so, two squares there of ST, not much, not that much ST there anymore, oh, that's pretty subtle, yeah, so, um, very subtle ST elevation, V1 to V4, if any. So I'm going to do one of those kind of STE V1 to V4. Any reciprocal changes with ST depression? No. Some PR depression? Maybe? No, not really. If there was PR depression, you could think about pericarditis, but he's asymptomatic, so probably not. Is this just a normal... Um, ECG? I don't think so. Because uh, you still have all the T waves looking. Like the thing with T waves being like this. Sorry, we hadn't gotten to T waves yet. They're all inverted. <laughs> Which is, I think, a worrying sign. Because you want them to, to all be... Like I think it means that there's... Um, it's, I think T wave inversion is a non-specific sign that there's something wrong in the heart. Usually ischemia. So, um, I don't know. Oh, he's still going. So we've got sinus rhythm with 70 beats per minute. That's roughly what we said. Um, acute inferior or anterolateral myocardial inf infarction with T-wave abnormality consistent with ongoing ischemia. So that surprises me because there wasn't any symptoms. Um, but that can happen. And oh, I forgot the Q-wave assessment. Of course, after you know, Q-waves are the marker of previous myocardial injury, so you always have to talk about them. The 
The presence of Q-waves in the inferior, anterior and lateral leads indicates completed infarction in these areas. Right, so once there's Q-waves, it means the infarction is over. So inferior leads is one. So this is the Q-waves. Two. Hang on, one isn't an inferior lead, sorry. One, two, three. There's Q waves in AVF, that's an inferior lead. Okay, so we've had an inferior MI now with Q waves, so that's completed. That's what they're saying. But there's biphasic T waves in anterior leads, V2, V4, and inverted T waves in the lateral leads. Um, suggesting persistent ischemia in uninfarcted myocardium. Whoa. A couple of emergency doctors need to be able to pick up on that. It's nuts. So we've got ongoing ischemia. Well, I guess it's important because you need to relieve the ischemia. Um, but obviously, but if it's 24 hours after a heart attack, you're going straight to cardiology anyway. So cardiologists would definitely be involved. Uh, inverted T waves in the lateral leads suggest persistent ischemia in uninfarcted. Yeah, so, okay, the, the key learning here is that if there's abnormal T wave pattern, then there's ongoing, oops, sorry, if there's abnormal T wave pattern, then there's ongoing ischemia. That's my key takeaway. Um, so they were talking about the inverted T waves in lateral V5, 6. So yeah, that's what we circled here. Whoops. And I guess they called this biphasic because it goes up and down. The biphasic T waves in the mid precordial leads by Wellens and colleagues is highly specific for a large proximal left anterior descending obstructive lesion. Okay, cool. So if I see T waves like this, I get worried because it's suggestive of uh, LAD obstruction. You need to get PCI, percutaneous coronary intervention, angioplasty, or stent placement. It does not respond well to medical management. Fair enough, it's the biggest artery of the heart, I'm pretty sure. This biphasic T wave pattern, which has come to be known as Wellens sign, cool, Wellens sign, we talked about that previously, I need to learn that, may persist or even develop when the patient is not experiencing pain. Aha, uh -huh, that's why the guy was pain free. This patient had urgent coronary angiography, which demonstrated 90% obstruction in the proximal LAD and treated with angioplasty. Angioplasty. Angioplasty and. Angioplasty. Good bloody lesson learnt there, okay? If you see biphasic T waves, alarm bells go off, especially in the mid precordial leads. Cool. Good progress, what are we? 15 minutes in, done two ECGs, let's keep hustling. Okay, we've got an irregular heart rate. Let's begin, we've got 31 year old nausea and vomiting. Hmm, they might be pregnant. Okay, it's sinus, we've got P waves, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave. P wave. So we've got a sinus arrhythmia, because obviously it's um, sinus arrhythmia. The rate, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, so 60 beats per minute. Um, that's positive in one, it's positive in AVF, mildly, not really, it's very subtle. So... Um, could be left axis deviation, but it's still subtly positive, so just say normal axis. Why is it uh, so... I don't know. Why is it so irregular? I'm looking for any other abnormalities. I guess I'm just looking at the P waves. 
this one looks a bit different to this one. Is that just a baseline wonder? Nausea and vomiting, hey? I mean, the thing is, it's irregular, but it's um, regularly irregular, if you look at it. Right? That's a pattern. I don't really know what causes that pattern, though. Because I know about heart blocks, obviously, that's when the P wave is getting further and further away and you drop a beat. Is that something? What's this? Look, this, you have two P waves. What's that and that and that? So that's a T wave, that's a P wave one, that's a P wave two. It's not really seeing any of the other leads though. All right, let's have a look. Hmm. So it's sinus rhythm, which is what we said. It's got our oh, packs, premature atrial complexes in a pattern of atrial trigeminy. We've got the rate. The rhythm is regularly irregular, that's what we said, because of the occurrence of packs. Packs are identified when P waves occur early in the rhythm. The morphology of the P waves are often slightly different to the sinus P waves, and the PR interval may be slightly different as well. Packs cause the sinus node to reset. That's interesting. Leading to a pause in the rhythm before the next sinus beat occurs. Oh, yeah, I can just see this up here. So, to be honest, I'm not fully clear of where the packs are. They So they trigger a complex and then they, f they make it reset. All right, well, this is a learning point. I need, I need to study this. I need to study packs. Let's write this in red. Study packs. Hey, Mars. Yeah, so I'm not sure, Miles, when you made that message, probably on the previous ECG when it had a really small QRS. Um, oh, no, the amplitude on AVF is really, really low. Look, if you have small QRS complexes along the precordial leads, I think with AVF you don't read too much into it because it might depend where the foot uh, node is placed. Um, 34, yeah. But definitely, I I know that you look at the amplitude of QRSs on the precordial leads uh, because if you think of the heart and then you think of someone's chest, you're putting the probes along the skin, but if someone is not thin, but rather like obese, obviously the probes on the chest are now, oh, that's not the right placement, but obviously the probes on the chest are now much further away from the heart, so the QRS amplitude is less. Alternatively, if they have massively hyperinflated lungs because they have COPD, that causes small QRS complexes. But in terms of AVF, I'm not too sure because if you put AVF like up here or down here on their leg, you might get different amplitudes. It's a good question though, Mars. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm just streaming whenever I'm, whenever I kind of feel like it. I had the day off, so I did some study. Uh, Mars, are you, um, what year of medicine are you in? Or are you paramedicine? All right, while you answer that, Miles, I'm going to start the next one. So we've got a 75-year-old female. Accidentally took too many of her beta blocker tablets. That's a bad idea. Cool. Oh, I was hoping we... I think we've got complete heart block, which is... Always... So I'm just highlighting all the QRSs. Now let's highlight all the... Let's change the color. Um, let's highlight all the P waves. Mm. 
Not many P waves. Maybe one there. Maybe one there. Maybe one there. Gosh, not easy to see them. Any other leads? Is that a P wave? That's a very short um, PR interval. All right, so let's do this rate. So the rate is one, two, three, four, five, six times six. Um, it's very slow. So the real rate's probably between 30 and 50. So we've got bradycardia. Let's just say 30 and 35. Bradycardia. It's not sinus because you don't see P waves before every QRS. So it's, um, to be honest, it's probably AV junctional rhythm because that makes sense with the beta blockers uh, it's slow and the T waves are all over the place so um, we got let's just do PR I don't think we can I don't think we can say what the PR interval is because it's not sinus rhythm and there's no there's no P waves before every QRS complex but we can look at other things so we can look at the um, T wave inversion Uh, in multiple leads and this is very high so conversely to the last one small QRS's mean there's a lot of distance between the heart and the electric probes this is if it's very high and I forget the exact criteria then you're worried about LVH left ventricular hypertrophy because that means the heart is bigger it's getting pressed it's it's full of muscle and it's getting pressed against the the wall and she's on a beta blocker which could be for blood pressure which might be uh which can is related to lvh write down what you th write down what you guys think this is by the way don't make me do all the work so yeah i think this is a junctional rhythm um Normal access, P waves gone, inverted T waves. Oh, cool, you've made an ECG before, Miles. That's sick. That's awesome. I wouldn't know how to build an ECG, but that could be a pretty cool, fun thing to do. Anyway, let's check out the. Um, the answer. Cool. So that's what we said. Oh, what? Septal MI. Okay, we'll have to look into that. That's a bit of an issue. Okay, we said it was a junctional rhythm. It's good. We said the rate was low. We picked up the T wave abnormalities, um, which can suggest um, ischemia. Um, but I guess it's a septal MI because you have the T wave inversion on V3, V4, V5, V6. So it's septal slash lateral. And you don't have it on L. Okay, so maybe it is a septal MI. Okay, P waves are, let me just bring the highlight out. P waves are absent for most of the ECG and the QR, oh, I can read up here actually. Oh, that's better down here. Uh, QRS complexes are narrow. So we have a junctional rhythm. A single P wave is found immediately preceding the final QRS complex, which is what we said, but unlikely to have been conducted because the very short PR interval. Right, that's also what we said, but I didn't understand. It's, so because that's actually such a short PR, it's probably unrelated to the QRS. Q waves are found in leads one to two, Oh, freaking hell, the Q waves. 
want to do consistent with a prior MI. Yeah, inverted T waves in the inferior and anterolateral leads indicate acute ischemia, probably because of the bradycardia, obviously, right? So the heart is like every other muscle. Um, you're going to get... It's like every other muscle. If, you, if, you, if, if it's not getting enough blood, you're going to get ischemia. So it's just... Um, Getting, uh, it's it's not a it's like a type two, MI I think you call it. Um, his patient was treated with glucagon for the beta blocker toxicity. Which sinus rhythm returned, the heart rate increased to seventy, and the T wave inversion all resolved. Glucagon for beta blocker toxicity. That's a good learning experience. So if someone has overdosed on beta blockers, go for glucagon. It'd be cool if anyone can write in the chat the mechanism around how glucagon works for beta blocker toxicity. All right, here we go. We've got a narrow complex tachycardia. All right, let's get a bit of a rate. It's very quick. To be honest, it's going to be quicker just to count the boxes. It's irregular. Like you can see that these are irregular. See, you know what this is, guys? This is a variable block. I think this is atrial flutter with variable block. Especially this is subtle. because This is suggestive because you've got three P waves. Uh, and it's not they're not capturing a QRS. And then finally, this one catches the QRS. Nothing captures. Nothing captures. Okay, 68 palpitations, generalized weakness. So symptomatic. I think it's uh, atrial flutter because of all the P waves, variable block. This guy needs some metoprolol. Now we've got a positive equivocal, so maybe left axis, but probably normal axis. And the rate you just divide the big box, I mean, it's it's basically 150s, maybe a little bit. Sometimes it's quicker than 150, sometimes it's slower. So it's roughly one, yeah, yeah roughly 150s. All right, let's see the answer. Atrial flutter, variable block, rate right 167. Well done, everyone. He knows saying, Brady Cardio just made me think of this anime I watched as a kid. There was this guy who said he could live longer because he made his heart rate go down. So his body would deteriorate slower. That is a, a bit of... A, is, look, there's a couple of true things and a couple of myths around Brady Cardio. Like, if you have a low resting heart rate, that can indicate that you have a good level of fitness. That's true. And my resting heart rate... It's, it can also be genetic. My resting heart rate is very slow. Um, but I think that's genetic more than fitness. I'm not very fit. Uh, my resting heart rate right now is probably around 50, but it can, I can, if I meditate, I can bring it down to 40 pretty consistently. It's so really, really slow. Uh, and would worry me if I saw someone in the AD with a heart rate of 40. Um, but the idea that, uh, you want your heart rate to be slow because it only has a finite number of beats is bollocks because you're actually doing high intensity exercise like working your heart really hard is a really good thing um, to sh like to work your heart. It's, that's that's like key to fitness. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought that was the answer to the next one. Thirty six. No, that's the one we just did. Ah, uh, you know, if I ever wanted to get into anime, what's the uh, what's a good show to watch? I could I could see myself getting into anime. I really like art. I really like drawing and stuff. So, um, yeah, maybe I'll enjoy anime. Feels like a lot of work to make an anime set, like to do all that drawing. Anyway, let's read through this. Stay on task, Sil. The rhythm is a narrow, complex, irregular tachycardia. The differentials include atrial fibrillation, flutter, variable block, and the multi. Oh, I didn't even talk about multifocal atrial tachycardia, which is when you need three different morphologies of your P waves. 
Distinguishing between these three dysrhythmias requires the inspection, close inspection of atrial activity. In this case, there's inverted flutter waves are found in inferior leads, confirming the diagnosis of flutter. Oh, I didn't know that's how you confirmed it. I just thought it looked like that. So inferior leads. There's inverted flutter waves in inferior leads. So let's have a look at AVF. Right. These. Okay, cool. The rhythm is irregular because there's varying degrees of AV block, 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1. ST segment depressions are found in lateral leads. This is common finding in tachydysrhythmias, especially SVT, and does not necessarily indicate critical coronary stenosis. Electrical alternans, varying amplitudes of every second QRS component, is present in V5 and 6. How did I miss that? That's cool. Oh, that's subtle. So electrical alternands is when you have big, small, big, small, big, small QRSs and uh, can suggest a tamponade. Anyway, apparently you can see be here as well. Um, in the patient in sinus rhythm, electrical alternands suggest the presence of a pericardial effusion. Yeah. Uh, so tamponade because of an effusion is what I was talking about. Um, however, electrical alternance is not an uncommon finding in tachydysrhythmias and has no clinical significance. Okay, cool. The heart just likes to bump around a little bit, I guess. Oh, no worries, you know. So do you edit videos full time, you know? Is that what you do? To keep busy? Um, oh, 4.51. i got to go soon. All right, sweet. Let's do one more ECG. Thanks for hanging out, Hino and Miles. Nice little ECG party. Whoa, what a one to end on. Sick. This is uh, alarm bells ringing. All right, let's be nice and structured. So first thing, whenever someone's, you know, first thing to do in any emergency is take your own pulse. So just everyone calm down. Everyone relax. Are you calm? I'm not calm. This guy's dying. All right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So rates around 66. Oops. Sinus rhythm, P waves before every QRS. Obviously, there's massive ST elevation and depression. We're going to get to that. Everyone relax. Axis positive, uh, positive, normal axis. Uh, all right, let's get to the good stuff. ST depression V1 to V3. Cool. ST elevation, AVF. Two, three. Cool. So inferior, STEMI. With depression in AVL as well. Um, I'm happy. Because AVL and mildly, A I mean, it's inferior, maybe some lateral. I'm going to put a question mark on that. Oh, clean. Science rhythm, 69. Acute, inferior and lateral. Okay, so they think lateral, yep. ST segment depression in the AVL V1, V3 is the reciprocal changes associated with acute inferior MI. Outstanding. What a case to end on. We just saved this guy's life. You said it, Hino. Just keep hustling. Keep absorbing um, knowledge. Miles, you were spot on. Good catch. Good catch. Good stuff. Oh, that's cool, Hino. Oh, man. We gotta, yeah, we got to talk more. 
Um, look, I've just been kind of editing my own videos here now, so I haven't uh, kind of extended the opportunity. Well, I haven't talked to you about more editing at this point. Um, kind of really liking live streaming more than making videos. I like the interactive aspect. There's way less editing. If you have any feedback for my channel uh, in terms of um, what I can do differently, like if you think there's some branding issues or I'm sure there's plenty of branding issues. If you think there's any other issues here, no, please uh, send me a message on, on Discord to talk about how we can make it. Uh, like I want to... I, I want to take this, I, I take I take YouTube semi-seriously. So it kind of like, I want to do this for the rest of my life. I want to do YouTube for the rest of my life. Um, but I also don't want it to become a chore. I want to do it because I enjoy it. And um, yeah, and I just, lo I love it. I love hustle. I love doing daily streams and stuff. So if you, but if you have any feedback on how I can make it better, I'm all ears. I want to hear it. Uh, and I've been taking on a lot of feedback. Some feedback I just don't take on though if it's too much work because it's just not realistic for me. I have to be, I like, uh, it's very important to stay realistic, um, I think. So, yeah, if you have feedback, let me know though. <laughs> all right, guys, that's it for this stream. Oh, thanks, Miles. I'll be doing heaps more of these. Um, I want to do 200 ECGs, and I'm only up to ECG number 37. So I'll just be dotting them around, sometimes in the morning, sometimes at night. Eventually, when, like in a couple of years' time, when I can own my schedule a little bit more, at the moment, the hospital owns my schedule more than me. So when I own my own schedule, I'll put up like regular timing. Um, but right now, I'm just... Just doing it whenever I can. Whenever I have an extra hour, I just uh, um, I'm doing it. Yeah, look, Miles, I I got all my knowledge of medicine from YouTube. Like seventy percent. YouTube was so important. So if you can you can informally study medicine all on YouTube. Maybe I should make like a informal medical university. <laughs> I don't know. All right, guys, I'm going to head. Have a good afternoon. Lots of love. See you guys all in the next stream.